Um, I had a quick question about the homework that's due on Wednesday. Number two, I think, it um, it asks you to do it in MATLAB, but you asked just for the transfer function. Oh, yeah, so, I, so not the actual question, but you just have to derive the transfer function. That's it. Do you want it in MATLAB or? No, okay. just by hand, like okay. doing the block diagram thing. Let's do we apply it? Do we have to? Do we have to like expand it? Oh, uh, actually somebody asked me this question. Don't expand it too much. Just, just get a form that the grader can read and, not the grader, the TA can read and actually make sure that it is correct or not. You don't have to derive the whole expression which could be very, very long. Okay, so, so, so far what we have done uh, in this class is we have talked about transfer function, we have talked about uh, simplifying block diagrams, uh, and then we use that, these ideas to figure out the properties of steady state error for certain specific systems. And we talked about transient response in the previous class, and we showed that for certain first order systems, if you use a proportional controller with sufficiently large gain, you can actually speed up the transient response and it can reach the equilibrium very, very fast, okay, using a feedback controller. Now today's class, we are going to talk about second order systems, okay? So first order systems are of the type So the transfer function is of the type k over tau s plus 1. Tau is the time constant for the system. And the lower the time co constant, the quickly the function will get to the equilibrium point. So that's first order system. Today, our goal is to study second order system where g of s is given by omega n square Okay, so the denominator is of uh, is a polynomial of order order 2. Okay, so in this particular second order system, the denominator is of uh, order two, and we are going to study step response, impulse response, and, uh, and all these other properties that we had seen in one of our previous classes. Okay, so percent overshoot, peak time, settling time, and there was one more thing, percent TP. So peak time, settling time, rise time, and percent overshoot. So we are going to derive the expressions for all of that for second order system. So second order system has quite a, uh, it's, it's quite an important class of systems and we will soon see, uh, perhaps in maybe next class, that in many cases you could approximate a very high order system by a second order system or a first order system or a combination of first and second order systems. Okay, so you saw one of one such situation in your assignment one question number four where you had a complicated, multi, uh, I think it was third order system and then you could actually simplify, a, a come up with a transfer function for a first order system, design a controller for the first order system and then saw its effect. <coughs> on the original third order system. So in many cases, you can either approximate a system using a first order system or a second order system or a combination of these two systems. And then you can design the controller for that simple system and then put it on the original system and see how, it, how the original system behaves. Hopefully it will behave fine. So, so that's why second order system is very, very important. Uh, and today, our goal is to study the response of second order system, uh, and in particular derive expressions for uh, four things that we had talked about in uh, one of the earlier classes. So, I have u of s, y of s, g of s, 
Okay, so let's look at the impulse response. So in the case of impulse response, u of s is equal to 1. So y of s is equal to what? It's equal to g of s equals to Okay, now if you look at the impulse input, so I can take the inverse Laplace transform. And the expression is omega n over square root one minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t sine omega dt, where omega d equals to omega n square root 1 minus zeta square. And this is for the case where zeta is in 0 comma 1, 1 not included. Okay, so what does this term consist of? There is some amplitude, a decay term that decays exponentially with respect to time, so as time increases, this one goes to zero. And then you have a sinusoidal term that induces oscillations in the output, okay? So the impulse response is going to look like a decaying sinusoid This is my time, this is my y of t. And this is for the case where zeta is in zero and in between zero and one. This is exactly the response of a uh, suspension system in any of the cars or trucks that you may have driven before. So you hit a road, road bump, okay, that gives an impulse response, uh, that gives an impulse to the suspension system. The suspension system goes through certain oscillations which decays, right? And eventually you don't see the effect of that particular bump. But initially, you do see such oscillations in that particular um, in, in the car or in the vehicle that you are actually driving in. So suspension systems are usually uh, an excellent example of a second order system. Another such, such example of a second order system is an RLC circuit that you might have tested before. Uh, if you give it a impulse response, you will see these oscillations. Uh, and you know, I was trying to look for a YouTube video where I could show you this oscillation, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a good YouTube video. So if you, ha if you find a YouTube video, share it with me, uh, where you can see this response in real time. I would definitely like to see it. And then I'll share it with the rest of the class. So, uh, so please do that if you can find some online resource or some online video where you can see such response in practice. I wasn't able to see it uh, today.
But this is what the response looks like uh, if your zeta is between 0 and 1. But it's important to know what the system response is going to look like when zeta is equal to 0, zeta is equal to 1, and zeta is greater than 1. So all these regimes, 0, 1, greater than 1, and between 0 and 1, uh, they have specific names. And so let's uh, try and see what, what happens in those situations, OK? By the way, don't worry about how I got this inverse Laplace transform. Of course, you can use a method of partial fraction to derive this expression. But usually, in exams as well as in, uh, in the book, I will provide, well, in the exams, I will provide a list of transfer functions and the Laplace transform, no, not transfer function. I'll give you a list of signals and transfer functions so you can use that list for solving your questions. But otherwise, uh, in the book, there is a list uh, of signals and their transfer function. So I looked at uh, not signal and their Laplace transform. So I looked at the Laplace transform, and then I did, I got the signal from that particular table. So you can use, you can always use the table to get the inverse Laplace transform for any uh, signal that you would like to uh, that you would like to do. So in exams, you don't have to worry about it because I'll provide you with the table for important uh, Laplace transforms. OK, so going back to our discussion, you have a decaying sinusoid when zeta is between 0 and 1, but then there are other values of zeta that are also possible. So let's try and study what happens when zeta equals to 0. This is known as undamped. case, zeta is between 0 and 1. This is known as damped case. When zeta is in, zeta is equal to 1, this is known as critically damped. And when zeta is greater than 1, then it's called overdamped system. OK, so let's see what happens when zeta is equal to 0. Then the transfer function g of s is omega n square over s square plus omega n square, which means that the poles, can someone tell me what the poles are for this particular system? Yeah, imaginary i or maybe j omega n. What do you guys use for imaginary numbers, i or j? i is usually used for current, right? So j is what you would use for imaginary numbers. OK, so plus minus j omega n, that's, those are the poles for this particular system. So if I draw the pole 0 diagram, you have two poles on the imaginary axis. that look like this. OK? And in this case, the impulse response <coughs> would look like just plain sinusoid. I'm going to refer to the table of Laplace transform. 
to make sure that this is indeed correct. So this will be omega n sine of omega n t. Okay. When zeta is equal to 1, so this is what the impulse response and if you draw the impulse response, it's just sinusoid. Okay, there is no damping whatsoever, there is no decay of the amplitude, the amplitude remains constant at omega n throughout the time. Okay, so in any system, if you have poles on the imaginary axis, you give it an impulse response, you will see some sort of oscillations that doesn't die out as time goes to infinity. Okay. A any, any questions on that? How did I get this expression using the uh, Laplace transform table? Okay. So for zeta equals to zero, it's called undamped case. The poles are on the imaginary axis. I do the inverse Laplace transform. I get that the impulse response is going to look sinusoidal. The amplitude is not going to decay over time and you are just going to see oscillations for all time t greater than equal to zero, okay? Now let's look at, we've already looked at the case where zeta is in zero comma one, that's known as the damped case. In the damped case, you had a decaying sinusoid and in, if you had looked at the expression, there was the amplitude term, a decaying exponential term and then a sinusoidal term, okay? However, omega n there, well, the frequency of the sinusoid for the for the damped case was different. Um, let me let me redraw or rewrite the yt for theta in zero one. Um, let's do the derivation from the scratch. So, what's the uh, poles? What are the poles of the system? Can someone tell me what the poles of this system is? This transfer function? Quadratic yeah, it's a quadratic formula. You're right. So what should the poles be? Anyone remember the quadratic formula? Okay, let me write it. Uh, x square plus ax plus b equal to zero. Then the poles are minus a plus minus square root a square minus 4b over 2. All of you remember this formula? This is the famous quadratic pro formula. So I'm going to apply it to derive the poles. Should be, should be over 2a. Oh, well, no, there is no. Yes, but like. So, okay, let me, let me write the one that you remember. <laughs> Ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, minus b plus <laughs> 2a, okay. Now this looks more familiar, okay, all right. Uh, let's apply that to the denominator here and figure out what the poles are. 
You want to give it a shot? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Who wants to give it a shot? Come on, be brave. Yeah. Well, there has to be a negative sign. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Four omega n square. Remember, you have an omega n square here. Yeah. And then divide it by two. So that's equal to minus zeta omega n plus minus. I have zeta square minus one. So I know that zeta is between 0 and 1. So therefore, that particular term is going to be negative. So I'm going to pull a j outside, omega n outside, and 1 minus zeta square inside. OK? And I'm going to rename this term as omega d, which is known as damped frequency. Damped frequency omega d okay so this is the these are the poles for the system. I'm going to rename this particular term. So omega n multiplied by square root of 1 minus zeta square. I'm going to call it damped frequency omega d. And then I have minus zeta omega n on the real part. And if I look at the response, impulse response, I get y of t, I need to see what the expression is again omega n over square root 1 minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t and then sine omega dt okay this minus zeta omega n appears here in the exponential this omega d appears here in the sinusoidal and then there is some amplitude term that depends on omega n and zeta, the damping factor. So that's the impulse response? Excuse me? That's the impulse response? That's the impulse response. We had just uh, written it a few moments ago on this side of the board, okay? And that's a decaying sinusoidal term. So this is the decay term, this is the sinusoidal term. And when zeta was equal to zero, you had sinusoidal, uh, the frequency of the sinusoidal was omega n, the natural frequency. Uh, whereas in this case, the frequency of the sinusoid is omega d, not omega n, okay? So note the change. And this omega d depends on the damping factor, zeta. Uh, in this situation, okay? Now comes the case where zeta is equal to one. zeta is equal to 1, then my g of s is given by omega n square over s square plus 2 omega n s plus omega n square. What does this uh, give me? I can actually make a perfect square in the denominator. So I have omega n square over 
s plus omega n square. Okay, so zeta equals to 1 is known as critically damped case and in this case the denominator can be uh, written in the form of a perfect square which means it has a double pole at omega n, sorry at minus omega n and the impulse response y of t How can we get y of t? Anyone has any thoughts? Let's look at, let's go back to the book, uh, table 2.3, and then try and figure out if there is a way to do the inverse. Uh, okay, so it's not there in the book. So we need to find out the impulse response from the first principle which is using partial fraction method. Um, is there another easier way? I am trying to think if there is another easier way to do this. No? Google. Sorry? Google. Google? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, well, unfortunately, I can't use that in the class. Well, I can, but I don't want to. Uh, what I do know is that it's going to be a sum of exponential and uh, uh, t multiplied by exponential term. So, trying to think what would be an easy way to do that. So. Let me, let me get a solution to this in the next class because I'm, it's not there in the Laplace table so I need to think about this particular impulse response uh, because I don't think I'm able to compute it uh, using any of the known methods right now. So I'll have to think about it a little bit. But nonetheless, the yt will be sum of exponentially decaying term and t multiplied by an exponentially decaying term. Now what the coefficient should be, I have to think about it and I'll get back to you on, in the next class. Okay. So this is something I'm going to do in the next class. Let's move on to the overdamped case, which is somewhat easier to do, uh, because there is no double pole in that case. So zeta is strictly greater than one. So I'm going to erase this part. Oh, actually, I don't need to erase it because the result is going to follow right from here. So if zeta is greater than one, Then the poles are given by this expression right here. So what do I get? Minus zeta omega n hmm. 
okay so in this case we have two poles both of which are on the real line and what would the response look like Let me call this lambda 1 and lambda 2 or minus lambda 1 and minus lambda 2. So S plus Okay, so now we have to use the method of partial fraction to get y of t. Has any of you used method of partial fraction before? Okay, so maybe some of you can help me. How should I get the coefficient for s plus lambda 1? Anyone remembers? Yes. That's right. So, well, no, uh, not s equals to negative lambda 2, because then that would make this term go to infinity. So, so if I want to get the coefficient of s plus lambda 1, I need to take s equals to negative lambda 2 everywhere else. So, Emmanuel, you have. T, e to the t, right? Not T e raised to T, it's uh, T e raised to T. So if we have S A, so uh, T e squared, won't it just be T e raised to the 8 negative A T? I, I think you are correct, but I have to go back and check. Okay. Uh, unless you are looking at some Laplace table that I am not. No. Okay. Uh, but I think you are correct, but I have to still go back and check if that is indeed the case. So he was anyways, he, uh, Emmanuel was talking about the previous uh, impulse response for the critically damped case, which uh, I'll get back to you in the next class. So in this case, I want to use the method of partial fraction. So I want to get the coefficient for 1 over s plus lambda 1. So do you want to give it another shot or um, someone else wants to? Okay, yes. Uh, we could cover S plus <coughs> lambda 1 and substitute minus lambda 1 in that expression, like it would be like omega n squared. Okay, so omega n squared. Uh, over minus lambda 1 plus lambda 2. That's right. Okay, Jeff, do you agree with this? Okay, so what did we do? Uh, we set s equals to negative lambda 1 uh, here and in this expression, but not in this expression. Okay, So s plus lambda 1 remained as it is. And then I put negative lambda 1 here. So I get lambda 2 minus lambda 1 and then omega n square. Uh, someone wants to try for this case. What would I get in the numerator? Yeah. Over? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So this means I have omega n square over lambda 2 minus lambda 1, 1 over s plus lambda 1 minus 1 over s plus lambda 2. Okay. This is what I get using the method of partial fraction. So 
my impulse response is going to be What's the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s plus lambda 1? E raised to minus lambda 1t? Yes. E raised to negative lambda 1t. And for this one, it's E raised to negative lambda 2t. Okay. If I plot the impulse response, which is given by this expression, it's going to look like this. So it gradually increases and then eventually converges to some steady state value, which is this number right here. So the steady state value will be omega n square over lambda 2 minus lambda 1. Okay. All right. So no matter what value of zeta we had, you first have to compute the poles. After computing the poles, you kind of realize that if the poles have imaginary part, we will have oscillation. If the poles are on imaginary axis, the oscillations will be undamped, which means it will never decay. You will keep seeing a sinusoidal wave throughout uh, the positive time axis. On the other hand, if you have poles, if you have an underdamped case where zeta is between 0 and 1, then your poles are, let me redraw where the poles are. So for those cases, the poles are in the, you have a real part and you have an imaginary part, okay? So in those cases, you see a decaying exponential impulse response. Uh, so eventually it converges to zero. Oh, this one will also converge to zero. So this is, this is the wrong figure. It should actually be going to zero because this is a decaying exponential. Okay, so this, this yt term is going to go to zero in the case of overdamped case. All right. So in the third case, you had a critically damped system for which the impulse response we don't know yet. Uh, we'll figure it out in the next class. And then we had the overdamped case where zeta is greater than 1. I could compute the poles. The poles are on the real axis. Um, and they are different from each other. So I use the method of partial fraction to figure out what the impulse response looks like by using the inverse Laplace transform. And we see that the impulse response is actually a decaying exponential. It goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay? And it starts from omega n square over lambda 2 minus lambda 1. So what have we found so far? Depending on the damping factor, whether it's zero or between zero and one or greater than or equal to one, you see three different types of impulse responses. In one case, you have uh, oscillations throughout. In the case of uh, undamped case, in the case of underdamped case, you have a decaying uh, oscillations. And in the case of overdamped or critically damped case, you will see a response where the impulse response is decaying exponentially. Yes? Um, that one started at zero, though, because you do No, this. Oh, I see. 
Uh, yes. Let me see in the book if they have plotted the impulse response. For, oh, yeah. So it looks something like this. Okay, yeah. So you are right. When t equals to 0, you have 1 minus 1, so that's equal to 0. When t goes to infinity, you have 0 minus 0, so that's equal to 0. And in the middle, it's going to go up for a little bit, and then it's going to decay as t goes to infinity. Sorry about that. So that uh, in the book, uh, they, they haven't drawn the thing for the overdamped case, but this is exactly what it's going to look like. Thanks for that, pointing that out. Yes? In that case, what value does that steady state line have? So in this case, <coughs> the steady state will be 0 uh, because as t goes to infinity, this term is going to go to 0, and this term is also going to go to 0. So you'll have the term so going to no zero. Point yeah, it's going to go to zero eventually. Uh, no, that will this will not feature anywhere because that's just the amplitude here. But there are two exponentials that are getting subtracted from each other, so I don't really know. Uh, where exactly would this fall in this particular graph? Okay. Um, it may not be. So this this particular so omega n square over lambda two minus lambda one. I don't quite know where exactly it will fall here, uh, because there, it's it's the amplitude of these two exponential, but we don't quite know uh, what the difference looks like. Well, the difference looks like this, but uh, this may not feature anywhere in this particular difference. Okay. Any any other question on this? All right. So we have so far we have studied the impulse response where U S is equal to one. The next thing that, that we want to study is the uh, step response, which is what happens when you give it a step input to a second order system. And we'll see a very similar behavior as we have seen for the impulse response. Um, so let's look at the step response. So in which case u of s is 1 over s, and y of s is g of s multiplied by u of s, so that's uh, g, of, g of s over s, that given by this particular expression. Okay. Now for this case, we again need to do the method of partial fraction in order to figure out what y of t looks like. Um, so let's do it again for the case where zeta is between 0 and 1, because that's a more complicated situation. So I have y of s equals to omega n square over s s square plus what should this be equal to when I do the partial fraction? So I'll definitely have a over s term plus what? 
Have any of you tried partial fraction for a second order equation in the denominator? No? Have you tried it before? Yeah, but I can't just like... You don't recall. Okay. Okay. All right. So when you have second order thing in the denominator, then you have to have B S plus C first order equation in the numerator and then over S square plus 2 zeta omega and S plus omega n square. So you can do it this way. Okay. This is one way to do it. The other way to do it is convert this into a imaginary, um, not imaginary, but you'll have, okay, let me get back to the other way of doing it later. But, okay, but this is one way of doing it. So let's try and figure out what the value of A, B, and C looks like. So the numerator is A square plus 2A zeta omega n s plus omega n square a plus b s square plus c s over okay now i have a pretty long expression So let me again collect the terms together. A plus B S square, two A zeta omega N plus C S plus omega N square A over that big expression, okay? And I know that this is equal to omega n square over the long expression. Anyone remembers what the next step of the trick is? Right, so, um, so I have A omega n square equals to omega n square. There is no S term here in the numerator, so this term has to be equal to zero. There is no S square term in the numerator, so A plus B has to be equal to zero. So I have three equations, three unknowns. We can solve it easily, and we can get the values of A, B, and C. So let's do that in the next class, and we'll find out what the step response for a second order system looks like.